Chapter 9 The Condemned House Nested in a crescent of trees, the Topanga Shopping Center was just a short block of mostly hippie-owned stores. It's where we first learned about the Condemned House and where I first saw Bruce. The house was to be torn down because it didn't meet the building codes. Its absentee owner could not legally rent it without making improvements. But locals said there was nothing wrong with it if you didn't mind living without utilities, topping another of Topanga's dead-end mountain roads. The property was wild-grown and private. The house was clean and it was wired for electricity, but couldn't be legally hooked up. Worse, the only available water was from a spigot at roadside. But there was also no rent, so we took it and set about making our own improvements. Buckets would have to be hauled from the road and kept in reserve to flush the downstairs toilet. Small carpentry projects were easy, and in the interest of space, a platform mattress was suspended on heavy chains from the ceiling. Any do-it-yourselfer knows that challenge inspires creativity. Down at the shopping center, I came out of the laundromat in time to see a stranger leaving our bus. I was suspicious until Charlie came out behind him. Bruce McGregor Davis was as dignified as his Scott English name, yet still befitting the Southern accent, the brushy mountain beard, the Levi's, and the motorcycle. He accepted Charlie's invitation to park it on the road by our house. And for the next few days, he tinkered with the engine a smile like a familiar song playing on his face. A nice blend of verve and reserve. Bruce was not easily distracted, but his face colored when he was struck by Charlie's humor or the eyes of one of us girls. Lying in the last patch of March sunshine on the wild grown grass that fronted our house, <clears throat> I was dissatisfied and restless. Dinner was already made. Feet bobbed from the treehouse. An expedition was trekking the backwoods to plant the seeds of our stash. I wanted to spend more time with Charlie. Just then, he walked out of the house, shaking something dusty. He paused only long enough to hand me a vest he'd found downstairs, asking if I'd fix it up for him. Then he was off down the walk with Bruce. It was all about motorcycles again. Half-heartedly, I inspected the material. Then I got an idea. I went to find the embroidery thread and forgot about all else. Brenda was the witch-handed girl who had brought us to the art of colored threads. Sitting on the lawn with five or six of us, she had pulled a wad of muslin from her pocket and, without breaking conversation, drew out an arm's length of thick embroidery thread. Separating the filaments by half, she dabbed an end on her tongue threaded the needle, and continued an abstract doodle on the material, her face lifting to our curiosity. It's easy, she said modestly. If you turn it and look at it in different ways, you can see creatures, faces, and stuff in the doodles. When I really like one, I fill it in. <laughs> they were unusual if not fantastic, forms of elongated and abbreviated creatures, caricatures, interconnected puzzles. They were tattoos 
and thread. Since being shown, the rest of us had been practicing stitches on muslin patches. The result was pure imagination. So it would be on the vest. A sun-dark boy with a Cheshire cat grin and a nose for opportunity drifted through our doorway one evening on the aroma of dinner. Dressed to the teeth in ashram white, his dark hair and skin slickly oiled, he glided past each of us, saying nothing more than, Hello. But with his eyes and eyebrows, what have we here? And how about this? Paul was 17 and a runaway. But he quickly assured us that he'd been staying with people all over the canyon and was a pro at avoiding the cops. He also announced that he'd been raised by American parents in Lebanon where marijuana and hashish were plentiful, and that he'd learned about sex from the maid. Speaking of maids, Stephanie, a new girl, was the medieval sort, the tavern wench, buxom and shy, with surprising bursts of hilarity. One evening in the kitchen, while we were cutting up the day's harvest, Stephanie said that her mother had told her if she took LSD, she would turn into a vegetable. <laughs> Ballooning her cheeks, she presented a convincing tomato, prompting rounds of vegetable mimicry. <laughs> well, we took up animals, Diane, often silent and separate joined in with such a sincere and wonderfully wall-eyed snake that she broke everyone up and got a nickname. <laughs> snake was prone to do-gooding, as seen on TV. Someone on a garbage run picked up a whole case of Tiger Shake, a sickly sweet powdered drink mix marketed to mothers to make milk more nutritious. After finding that the powder reeked of old vitamins, we put it aside to return it to the dumpster. But Snake began sneaking it into our food. Each of her secret attempts to fortify us produced protests and puke faces at first bite. But she was incorrigible until somebody hauled the stuff away. Nothing is quite like the taste of spaghetti sauce made with tiger shake. One night, I was with Charlie in an older car on the coast highway. He picked up a couple of young hitchhikers, teenagers, a boy and a girl carrying baggage. Climbing into the back seat, their faces were serious and conversation sparse, avoiding any indication of where they were coming from or going. <clears throat> Charlie asked them if they needed a place to stay for the night, and the boy quickly said they had somewhere to go. When we came to our turn off, Charlie pulled the car off the highway and sat staring towards the ocean. The road was unpopulated, but for an infrequent, swiftly passing car. He turned to me and said, Come on. Following his lead, I got out of the car. The teens looked scared and confused. Holding the driver's door, Charlie said to them, You can drive, can't you? Well, yeah, the boy said. Come on, then, Charlie told him. The two got into the front seat. Through the driver's side window, Charlie said, The pink slip is signed in the glove box. That's your ownership paper. Here's 50 for gas. Now it doesn't go too fast 
and you have to check the oil. It's got a leak. Not bad, but check it. The boy nodded. They both thanked us, smiling. We walked a while, and then hitchhiked a ride back into the mountains. Charlie was always giving things away, but just being there was worth the price of admission. I inherited a thousand dollars from a great aunt, and it took him over a week to get rid of that. He was driving a car full of us up the canyon from the beach and stopped for another hitchhiker. Good afternoon, he said, pretending to be a British chauffeur. This is Master Bruce, Princess Rooptidoo, Countess Diddy Dad, and uh, Lady What's Her Name. And where may we take you today? From the back seat, the hitchhiker, with noticeable discomfort, said something short and brittle, causing Charlie to toss out the accent and tone it down to normal. But then he came up with an interesting proposal. Tell you what, he said. I'll trade you all the money I got in my pocket for all the money in yours. The hitchhiker's face wrinkled. He was in his teens or early 20s. It could be a very good trade for you. Charlie said frankly, looking into the rearview mirror. The hitchhiker touched his pocket and hesitated. No, nah, I don't think so, he said, dodging a scam. Are you sure? Charlie asked. You better be sure. How do you know? I might have a thousand dollars in my pocket. Yeah, I'm sure, the hitchhiker said. A couple of us asked him, Well, how much you got? Without looking, he estimated he had three or four dollars in change. Charlie pulled out the thousand dollars in small bills, fanned, and raised it so that the hitchhiker could see it. His jaw went slack. You were really going to trade? Sure, Charlie said. If you hadn't been so afraid of losing your change. Ain't no security in this stuff. The security's in you. As long as you hold on to money, that's all you got. It was a time of plenty. People were dropping out and dropping in. One couple gave Charlie a beautiful new red Mustang. And at first, I could not pull from my memory any trace of what happened to it. After all the enthusiastic excursions, people found reason to take in it. Melba buttoned her chiffon robe and fussed over her hair as she opened her back door on the mornings we came to clean her stables. Charlie and Bruce came along just to visit and gave her a reason to look good, because they always told her when she did. Habitually nonchalant, Melba still pretended that we were poor people she was helping. But when her southern relatives were unexpectedly coming to see her, she fretted and worked herself up asking Charlie if he might have extra money to lend just until after the visit. I wasn't there that day, but I was told he shook his head firmly in the negative. He said he wouldn't loan her money because it would tie him up having to keep track of what she owed. So he gave her two hundred dollars. And he gave her the Mustang. He said it suited her. I was sorry to see the car go, but I would have loved to have seen Melba trying to be nonchalant about that. Throughout 1967 and early 68, 
Mary Cad conscientiously kept herself healthy. Her experiences in the shades of her pregnancy were personal. Not one to complain about aches and pains, she sometimes climbed the hill across the house carrying a sleeping bag. She'd sleep the afternoon on the grass under the trees and return feeling better. I almost expected her to carry off the sleeping bag and return with a baby. <laughs> but she wouldn't deprive us of this event. It was April. Sandy. Half babies? Are you kidding? How mundane. Any animal can give birth. I'd rather develop my mind than wash diapers, cook meals, and take care of a house day after day. My mother wore a green apron with black letters saying, to hell with housework. And she was very witty and very clever and children were a burden. I went to college to learn to be witty and clever and to make the right allusions to the right books and the right people at the right times. And I was getting it down good. I thought women who had children were trapped. The women on the college lawn who circulated petitions to legalize abortions always had my firm support. Illegal abortions were a fun in thing to talk about with other girls, even if you barely knew each other. Once I moved into an apartment in San Francisco with three girls. One was the daughter of the president of an airline, another's father was a movie star, and the third was the granddaughter of Carl Menninger, the noted psychiatrist. The girls were all clever and neurotic. I felt I was in my element. We discussed mutual experiences. Well, in Juarez, all you do is call this number and make an appointment. One by one, you go into this room, get on a cot, and this woman puts a bunch of cotton up you to begin the contractions. They give you the pentosal and zap! You wake up and it's gone. They must run 30 girls through there a day. They got a big house and they give you some real groovy orange spice tea when it's all done. My father paid for mine. The bummer was I lost my glasses coming home on the plane. I carried this with me, along with my birth control pills, out of San Francisco on a break from work and school to Los Angeles, where I first met Charlie. I had hoped to go surfing, but my artist friend kept raving about Charlie and this bunch of girls who were always with him. He borrowed a small plane, and we flew to L.A., rented a car, and drove to Topanga Canyon up a long, winding road until we came to a dead end. The moon was out, and I saw no house. Just an old black school bus. <clears throat> parked on a slightly sloped hill. It was silent, but for the sounds of crickets and frogs far below. As we got out, a cat came to rub against my legs, and a blonde, very pregnant girl moved up the hill towards me. Mary! Hello! My friend recognized her and they hugged. He made reference to her belly and she told him it wouldn't be long. My first thought upon seeing her belly was, what an unfortunate state to be in. Mary picked up my suitcase and led us down a short path to a small house. She turned to me at the door. You should see this when it's light out. It's really magic. Their little roses and vines growing all over the house. We went in. I needed to use the bathroom, so Mary set my bag down and let me down a steep flight of rickety stairs to a dark, cluttered basement. 
She struck a match, and as we turned into the bathroom and continued to burn matches, I fumbled for the toilet seat. She handed me the paper. Where are you going to have your baby? I asked her. Right here in the house. She replied, with all the enthusiasm of a child about Christmas. The girls are going to deliver it. What girls? Oh, you'll meet them. They're upstairs. This stumped me. A hundred hows and what ifs clogged my head. Are you married? I questioned. Or will your boyfriend take care of you? <laughs> Neither, she laughed. I felt awfully conventional and too embarrassed to ask any more questions. The toilet didn't flush. Mary dumped a bucket of water in it and led the way up the dark stairs. I'm going outside to wash some dishes, she said. We haven't gotten side water, so we wash under the hose. Did you see the bathtub in the front yard? I hadn't. Make yourself at home, she said. <clears throat> I went into the living room. Home? Christ, the house didn't fit into any category of anything I'd ever experienced. No shelves of books or electricity, just candlelight and the glimmer of a dying fire in a pot-bellied stove. What kind of place was I in? There was no intellectual debate in the air. In fact, it seemed to be a place of timelessness. I uncomfortably shifted my body into various stances, removing my glasses and putting them on, untying and retying my hair. A girl, Sadie, with snappy brown eyes and electric movements, motioned with her eyes to a guitar laying on a tapestry-covered mattress, simply saying, Stephanie. Instantly, the guitar was in Sadie's hands, something familiar that I could relate to. I walked over and sat cross-legged in front of Sadie, expecting to hear her peace and freedom songs or something like that. A low, strong, eerie voice began swelling to the tone of a minor chord that her fingers flicked into ever-changing rhythms. I was afraid of her. I felt plastic. When did you start playing the guitar? I interrupted. Since right now, she said simply. And the soul moves you. You don't need anyone to show you what someone else has showed them. You just do it. I looked over to the girl who had been standing in the entrance watching us. She was so young. A thick mane of auburn hair framed her small face and her clear green eyes that looked right through you. That snake, Sadie sang. Snake kind of galumped over to us, body loose, and knelt down beside me, saying nothing. Do you play guitar too? I blurted. Yes, she replied in a soft, faraway voice. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. Sadie saw my puzzlement and said, It's like you can do anything you want to do. Just know you can, and you can. Now the eyes of these two strange creatures were on me, and I felt uncomfortable. I went to the door of the kitchen where there were electric lights. Lots of crates and assorted food in boxes lay on the tables and floor. There were girls all over the place. Some were sitting on the floor cutting up vegetables, and some were stirring food over a Coleman stove. Others were crushing fruits into a strainer, 
getting the juice. One girl, right out of a 1930s Broadway musical. Her huge blue eyes and wavy blonde hair beneath an old top hat looked up from her breadboard. Shaking flour from her hands, she smiled, saying, Ella. And everyone in the room looked up at me with cheery hellos. Ella said, You want to help us with the dinner? The guys will be home soon. Just then, from the basement, came singing, louder and louder, and then giggles, and more singing, a spontaneous madrigal. No, Patty, my love, twas you, twas you who stashed the weed, the precious weed. And it got very loud. Let us trip it, trip it, trip it around the room. Oh, do me and Brenda Lynn or Sue. She'll put it in the stew and make of us another hue. Do. Everyone laughed and the girls in the kitchen sang back. Ella handed me a knife and some celery sticks. Where did you guys get all this food? We did a garbage run today. You ought to come the next time. It's really fun. So many questions I wanted to ask, but I couldn't. Somehow my questions didn't belong here. Yet these girls looked so familiar. Freckled faces, brown, red, golden hair, straight teeth, small bodies. My old playmates? My sisters? And that Sadie in the living room. She was the girl I wasn't allowed to play with. The Madrigal Quartet, bearing the rolled grass, bound up the stairs into the kitchen. The room became electric with sound and movement. I was being inspected. A tiny long-haired girl wearing a long ruffled skirt and no top began ruffling began fondling my hair. Your hair's so pretty. Why don't you take out that rubber band and let it breathe? She told me. Without thinking, I handed Brenda the rubber band and she said, you know, Mary and Ella used to wear glasses, but they threw them away. Can I see your glasses? I handed them to her and she put them on looking pretty crazy with her long hair flowing over her bare shoulders and breasts and my round brown framed glasses. Your eyes aren't so weak and they're pretty, she told me. Whispers of, yeah, really, filled the room. Brenda left the kitchen with my glasses and rubber band. She returned with a long blue velvet dress, explaining, I just made it today, and I was waiting for the perfect person to come along to wear it. Put it on. <clears throat> At my hesitation, she said, Ever heard of the Magical Mystery Tour? You know, the one the Beatles are singing about? <laughs> well, we're on it, and it's fun. It's, you know, being different people every day. I put the dress on, reluctantly. It was beautiful, and I didn't want to look beautiful. This little creature, Brenda, was stripping away my identity, making me into a Renaissance princess. All the girls got in on the act. Lace and ribbons were pulled out of boxes. A jewel tied around my neck and an antique ring with tiny diamonds placed on my finger. I'd better take these things off, I told them, turning to find my striped pantsuit. That's okay. You can have all this stuff. We just play with these things, they told me. 
I was removing the ring with the diamonds, saying, Here, this is valuable. Stephanie held my hand still and said, It was my grandmother's wedding ring. It's yours now. And when you get tired of it, just pass it on. This was too much. I slipped out of the kitchen, recovered my clothes, my glasses, and tied my hair back. A car door slammed outside. Ella exclaimed, The guys are home! I crawled onto the couch in the shadows and watched five men come through the door. I had not hidden well enough. Charlie came into the living room straight to me and removed my glasses, saying, Hello, pretty girl. Taking time off from college? Before I could muster a reply, he was back with all the bustling in the kitchen. Candles were brought into the living room and set in the middle of the floor. A bunny-like girl moved next to me. More girls sitting next to her, and soon there was a circular conglomeration of that I wasn't sure what. <laughs> the room became hushed. The girls brought the food and placed it down gently. I watched as Charlie tasted from a bowl and said, mm -mm, You witches are too much. <laughs> he passed the bowl to Bruce and said, You dig the love these girls put into their meals? Snake peeled the grapes, took the seeds out of the cherries, cracked the walnuts, and I saw her making that yogurt from scratch a few days ago. He looked at Snake and said, Watch the nutshells, honey. These witches are tricky too, brother. He said, winking at Bruce. Snake, I see what you do. You don't have to put nutshells in the salad to get my attention. Snake shrugged and laughed. The way everyone talked, Bruce was a newcomer. He and Charlie looked like blood brothers. After the meal, Ella lit up joints, gave one to each of the guys, and they sent them around the circle. I asked one of the girls how they paid for the weed, and she said that people just gave it to them. Charlie took the guitar and began playing a song that made my loaded computer spark, fizzle, and die. There's a time for living, the time keeps on flying. You think you're loving, baby, but all you're doing is crying. Can you feel all those feelings real? Look at your game, girl. I felt empty, lonely, and confused in the midst of so many happy faces. The rhythm changed, and he was singing. With your can cough medicines and you wonder drugs, you got more sickness than you got cures of. Cancer of the mind, take a look at yourself. Take yourself off the shelf. You can belong to no one. I felt like leaving the room right away. Charlie was in my head. No, you can't hide from intensified tide. He sang, laughing. Suddenly, he switched to a romantic fantasy song, and I felt I was off the hook. It made sense to me now. My artist friend wanted to be like Charlie. In San Francisco, he lived in a comfortable home with four young children and a wife. Soon after meeting me, he suggested I meet her. The times were unconventional but I found myself feeling very ill at ease, sitting in their living room. She was a pleasant woman, but he was proposing a menage a trois, and I sensed her relief when I didn't agree. 
while I'd attended the University of Oregon, a college professor had shocked me with a similar proposal. I had never considered kinky sex, and going to bed with a husband and wife was out of the question. In Topanga, I slept in a room beside my friend, but he was asleep before I lay down. Routinely plagued by insomnia, I lay awake listening to the sighs and soft moans of people in the other rooms making love. When I awoke the next day, my friend was already up, having planned to fly back for work that afternoon. He seemed neither surprised nor upset when I told him I decided to stay. I called San Francisco to tell my boss and my roommates that I wouldn't be back for a while. That night, after another circular gathering, Charlie asked if I'd like to go for a walk. He told me to ask one of the girls for a blanket. I started to ask why I needed a blanket, but felt he could see through my attempt at naivete. We left the house, walking down the path and up a hill in the moonlight. He turned to look at me and touched my throat, his fingers tracing a tracheotomy scar. I explained that I had been sick as a child and even had most of one lung removed. And before I could go on, he told me to forget the past. He said he knew I was strong, just as the baby Mary would have would be strong. Those people in the house and you. You haven't even begun to see what super creatures you are. The babies you girls will have won't have to go through what you went through. They'll be like nothing anyone has ever seen. And I was nervously poking my leg with a pencil. You don't like babies, do you? He said taking the pencil and tossing it. Well, it's like, I mean, well, you know. I began running down about overpopulation, finishing my education, and that an old psychiatrist of mine had once told me I wouldn't make a good mother because my mother wasn't a good mother. And that for me to have a baby would be unfair to a child. Charlie looked bored. I felt silly. He said, Jesus Christ, Sandy. I don't give a fuck about your mother, your psychiatrist, or any of your other crazy problems. I see you. And I see you would make super babies. You take birth control pills, huh? And I said he was right. Well, I'll be right here. You run back to the house and get them for me, would you? I didn't really think about it. I just went and found my purse and pulled out the dial a pill plastic container of pink pills. When I came back, he was sitting on the blanket under a tree. I sat down, tucked my legs under me, and lit a cigarette. I handed him the pills, and he looked them over in the moonlight, shaking his head. Here, give me a drag of that cigarette, he said, and take your clothes off. My clothes? He sat there watching. I removed my jacket, tugged off my shirt, and then put the jacket back on. It was warm out. Go on, he said. I turned my back to him and took my pants off. Come on, Sandy, he said. You know you're pretty. He slid me down to him and I closed my eyes. Gently, he removed the rubber band and ran his hands through my hair, massaging my temples and head along the way. 
quit thinking, he said. <laughs> he held my head in his lap, rubbing the muscles with his fingertips in continuous motion, stroking my neck and down my back, he said. Take off my clothes. I unlaced his moccasins while he continued caressing and feeling more and more of my body. He removed his shirt. Lie down, he said, pulling off his pants. I did, and he covered my embarrassment with his small, warm body. Just lie still and let me move you. My body responded while my mind was amazed. He kept moving in a gentle dance. He made love to me for a long, long time. And when he sat up, he was still hard. He said, Sandy, you'll never make love until you quit thinking. And I said, but I, I didn't know you could. How do you? Well, other girls are sure missing out. He said, the more I love, which is more each day, the more man loves, the longer he can make love. It's guilt, doubt, and all that negative thinking that cuts them off. Your kids won't be stuck with that. If you hadn't been taking those pills, I could have gotten you pregnant. When we got back to the house, candles were lit. Mary was in labor. No shrieks of pain or fingernails digging into sweaty palms as I'd seen in the movies. She was making music. The most beautiful high, sweet panting sounds, and her skin was white and glowing. All the girls were smiling and calm around her. My mind was still with Charlie. I felt very strange. I crept over to sleep in the swinging bed. I awoke at daylight to a moan that climbed to a high cry. Peeking from behind the tapestry, I saw Mary on a clean, sheet-covered mattress, the girls around her massaging her neck and holding up her legs. A fly buzzed, then another moan, light panting, and Mary yelled, It's coming! Blood ran from her, but I didn't know what to think. What was emerging from her looked all wrong. Something was on top of the baby's head. It was purple, the size and shape of a walnut. Perspiring faces around her paled, and a silent fear solidified. Then a little penis appeared and peed. One of the girls exclaimed, it's a boy! It's a boy! What's happening? Mary cried. Patty said, It's okay. He's breech, but he's coming. Mary struggled to rise, saying, Help me up. The girls propped her at the foot of the bed as she instructed, supporting her back and elbows so she could squat above the floor. Now... Oh. She yelled louder. The boy first inched, then slid, unfolding from her body. But his head didn't come out. All was still. Mary was panting, beads of sweat all over her body. The room was hushed. The baby's body was long, narrow, and milky blue in color. I thought he was dead. 
I was waiting for someone to move to find a doctor. Mary moaned and pushed to no avail, at last coaxing softly. Come on, baby. Water and blood poured from her. Then, bloop, the baby fell into Sadie's hands. He didn't move or cry. Brenda took him and held him upside down, patting him on the back. Mary put her mouth to his, drawing fluids from his mouth and nose. Finally, to everyone's great relief, he let out his first breath and a tiny cry. I was in a state of mild shock. Charlie's lovemaking and the baby's birth began for me a mind-blowing week that included my first acid trip. A day or two after the birth, Charlie took me to a music club in Topanga, where the band Buffalo Springfield played, and to Old Topanga Road, where I was introduced to Bobby Beausoleil. He was good-looking, but if someone had told me by the end of the year I would be pregnant by him, I wouldn't have believed it. I met Bobby's landlord, Gary Hinman. On learning that I was going through a bout of insomnia, Gary offered me non-prescription sleeping pills. I wasn't sure I would use them, but I slipped them into the po pocket of my jacket. Back at the condemned house, I met Phil Kaufman, a sometime roadie who connected well-known music people in Hollywood. What got my attention was his humorous repartee with Charlie. In the early 60s, I was under 21, but had gotten into an adult nightclub in San Francisco to see Lenny Bruce, famous not only for his humor, but because he said fuck on stage before any other comedian. I'd also seen The Committee, a San Francisco improv group that was very funny and cool. But Charlie and Phil Kaufman topped all these guys. Phil had been at Terminal Island Federal Prison for smuggling marijuana. After hearing Charlie play a guitar and sing on the prison yard, he wrote to his producer friend at Universal Studios that Charlie sounded like a young Frankie Lane. Frankie Lane was popular in the 40s and 50s, and when I was very young, He'd been a guest of my parents at their house in Del Mar. Phil would go on to be a road manager for the Rolling Stones and other popular groups. What impressed me was that he and Charlie didn't express bitterness or anger about their time in prison. Just humor. They were imitating the ubiquitous radio communications between prison guards, including the static. Bap. We got a 224 in prop. 10-4 squat. Two in custody. Two in custody. 205. The bus is out there. The building. Their parody of a totally alien way of life was hilarious. I wouldn't realize how right on it was until I did time in the same prison. Eight years later. That week, Charlie gave me my first tab of acid assuring me that it would not make me go crazy, as I feared it would. He drove me to a summit overlooking Los Angeles, and, unprovoked, I saw the scene below me in flames. I laughed and laughed until I cried. I don't remember what was so funny. It was like I was privy to some huge cosmic joke. I'd never laughed so hard before that, nor since. Later, when I asked Charlie about the laughing, he said that I'd seen the whole thing. He drove me to a more secluded place and told me to get in the back seat of the car and take my clothes off. When I did, he told me I was beautiful, but never to use my beauty. He made love to me, and when later I told him I didn't remember anything about it, 
he said. Your soul got it. Afterward, we went to a house where a few people were, and we started dancing with Lynn. Petite, with long red hair, she appeared bright and colorful. They seemed matched in size and energy. By this time, the effects of the LSD were wearing off, and I was feeling dull and inadequate, especially when I saw them dancing together. Sparks of energy flying off their hair, hands, and bodies. It was almost like looking into a big bonfire. I felt that Charlie was showing me a mirror of the energy that was inside of me once I would let go of my past. Next. He took me to a house in Malibu and introduced me to a woman named Melba. By then, the acid was really wearing off, and I was feeling very ill at ease. I didn't know what the relationship was or how to interact. My mind was blown. Part of me felt that he was trying to impress me and maybe to impress Melba. What I wanted was the privacy and comfort of a warm shower to clean myself of all the intense experiences of the evening. As it turned out, he had brought me to the right place. I believe that Charlie could see my and others' innate brightness layered over with our personal histories. He was smart to show me someone much like myself who was freer and happier and having fun and then take me to the home of an older woman with all the trappings of wealth. My parents were not rich, but certainly well off. They were comfortably uncomfortable. Both came from families of good social standing. They had two daughters before I came along by then, they were beginning to separate, and from that beginning, I had breathing problems that put me in and out of the hospital and later disrupted my schooling. Absence from school, but mostly extreme anxiety, fostered reading and learning difficulties, and I never felt comfortable anywhere in high school. Until in high school, when a group of girls and I were drawn together in camaraderie. They were the bright, popular girls, the cheerleaders and class officers, and no one suspected one of them of painting obscenities on the football bleachers. They had an enthusiasm for learning, but they also had a good, healthy rebel side that I was always eager to aid and abet. We called ourselves the Knights, and in our times of nighttime roving, I felt a kinship and security I hadn't known before. There was also music. All of my friends could harmonize and play instruments. One had composed pieces performed by the San Diego Symphony, beginning when she was nine years old. Sometimes the knights would sneak onto the grounds of the San Diego Starlight Opera one time during a performance by the New York Philharmonic with Leonard Bernstein conducting, I lost my footing on the hill, slid noisily through the brush, evoking shh is from the audiences, and a moment I thought I'd go tumbling into the orchestra pit. Graduation, colleges, and careers split the nights apart, and I was alone again, even with other people. When I entered San Francisco State College, after almost two years at the University of Oregon, while others were discovering the Beatles, I was listening to Gregorian chants and madrigals. My sister, Ginny, had introduced me to Baroque musicians. She was dating the son of a conductor for the LA Philharmonic Orchestra, and also seeing a psychiatrist. Ginny was beautiful, talented, popular, and at the top of all her classes. She had attended Sarah Lawrence College in New York. She had also been in two state psychiatric hospitals. 
I longed to be as cultured and informed as she was. I wanted to learn about every culture on earth, especially my own Northern European heritage. So after seeing the faces of Brenda, Lynn, and the other girls in Topanga, and hearing them sing, like they, like my old friends, struck a deep chord, I thought, these could be my people. I had so many defense mechanisms that weren't needed there. There was no alcohol, no mood-altering pharmaceuticals, no outward expressions of depression. The police came as civil servants. Did everyone know that the house was condemned? They were told it was being fixed up, and they left, but returned to run identification checks. Then, one day, the girls had gone on a garbage run, except for me, Snake, Brenda, and a few of the others. Mary and the baby were visiting friends. I hadn't slept a full night in weeks and was contemplating the sleepies pill I found in the pocket of my jacket. Brenda said, Every time I turn around, the police are barging in. One time they came in the afternoon, so I took some ivy and wrapped it around myself and just stood out in the backyard. Where do you sleep? I asked her. Down the hill by the creek, she said. She got a slight grin on her face and added, I missed all the wild creatures that roam the hills at night. I watch the flashlights go in and out of the house, and I hear the cops grumbling on their way to their cars about how many girls are living in this house, and that one guy's an ex-convict. She moved to the window. I heard two car doors slam. I knew it she said. They're here. She slid out the back just before three big cops stormed through the front door saying, Jesus Christ, how do you live like this? I told them I was visiting from San Francisco. How old are you? 24. Bullshit. You're not over 16. Where's your ID? I proceeded to show one of them my passport. Okay, empty your pockets. I dug around and handed him some Kleenex and four tablets. Three yellow sleepies and one quiet world. Where'd you get these pills? A friend. They're sleeping pills you can buy in a store. He said... Hey, Ed, this kid's got Nembutal on her. They rounded up the few of us and took us to jail, charging us with possession of my pills and some weed seeds they said they found outside the house. I think everyone was released but me. I kept telling them, you can get sleepies and quiet world in any drugstore without a prescription. But they held me for six days until I made bail. I'd attended two colleges. I'd been to Europe. I had never been to jail. In a word, jail was concrete, both sterile and dirty. Three-fourths of the day was noisy, and the glaring fluorescent lights buzzed. After six days, the girls from Topanga picked me up at the gate and took me back to the condemned house. That night, I was so exhausted. I didn't need pills to sleep. Sandra Good was like the faceless secretary in old movies who becomes stunning with the simple removal of hairpins and glasses. In real life, she clung to her reservations and seemed to want to observe the rest of us, rather than participate in what we were doing. That time, she was so removed as not to be seen. Perhaps due to the sheer numbers of us, the incriminating evidence found outside her house could not be pinned on anyone except Snake. 
Deputies found Snake's false ID with the weed seeds. She was then 15, but in keeping with her new ID, she gave her age as 20. At the women's jail, she was taken out of her cell and questioned all night long. And each time they told her they knew she was not 20 and that she would never get out if she didn't tell them the truth. She stuck by her story. Finally, they released her with her new name and age, henceforth confirmed by her arrest record. With continued police surveillance, it was time to move. The weather was warm, and all the bus windows were open as Charlie drove us to the beach, and then north, past the populated parts of Malibu, until the land opposite the beach was undeveloped. When he saw a road between two mountains, and no signs of ownership, we bumped inland on uneven flood cratered dirt toward foliage and twisted scrub oak, until a rear tire lodged in a crevice, and the back right side of the bus sank six inches. Charlie and a couple of the guys were resigned to moving the bus because it was still within sight of the road. But everyone else seemed to consider this fate, happily getting out and trekking into the woods. Several hundred yards inland was a round clearing close to a stream where birds and butterflies were plentiful, and there were no telephone wires. The guys wanted to hike around the stream, and most of the girls wanted to stay around Mary and the baby. Charlie named the baby Sunstone, with Mary's agreement. But the men waiting out the birth on the porch said that a hawk flew over the house as they first heard his cry, so he became Sunstone Hawk. Soon after the birth, a neighbor who happened to be a medical doctor had examined Sunstone and said, to no one's surprise, deemed him perfectly healthy. To us girls, he was a source of wonder, especially to Mary, who couldn't stop smiling or looking at him. At late afternoon, we made a circle of stones and a fire. After a light meal, we laid sleeping bags and blankets around the embers, and we all went to sleep. I awoke, hearing a crunch. Everyone's breathing sounded heavy in sleep. Then big beams of light strangely lit up enough woods so I could see two large animals, German shepherds, emerging from the brush. My attention quickly shifted from the dogs to the ends of their taut chains. You are all under arrest. Get up and keep your hands where we can see them. Again? There must have been 10 or 12 officers. Everyone got up, resigned to a procedure that would take all night. March out of the woods, single file at gunpoint, we were ordered to sit on the ground at roadside, where a paddy wagon and four blinking squad cars awaited us. Our IDs were collected, and after some official hubbub, names were read, four at a time summoning each of us to a different car to be searched and probed for data. Most of us had already been recorded when Johnny Bluestone's name came up. Coincidentally, Johnny was standing by another squad car, giving personal information about his other name. <laughs> Whatever his logic or lack thereof, he'd been carrying both his IDs. John Bluestone, the officer called again. Here. Charlie stepped forward, grinning and raising his hand. The officer said, We already got you, didn't we? Soon, we were all laughing. The big shepherds were sitting beside us, getting scratched behind the ears, when... And sudden realization, their embarrassed handlers commanded, Heal! Snake recovered three tabs of acid, 
buried one and swallowed two. She wasn't the only one deciding not to forfeit the treasured stash. Charlie took whatever he was holding, it ultimately becoming responsible for an iconic mug shot of him taken at the Ventura County Sheriff's substation and later published on the cover of Life magazine. Everyone was charged with trespassing on government property, although there was no sign and grand theft on the assumption that the bus was stolen. Mary was charged with endangering the life of her child, who'd been sleeping snugly beside her in her sleeping bag. The next day, most of us were released without charges, except Mary. The county wanted to prosecute her for child neglect. Their motivation was questionable and could have been fueled by gossip. A local newspaper had run a sensational story under this headline. Nude hippies found strewn in weeds. Mary was quoted as saying as an afterthought, just before being driven to jail. Oh wait, my baby's in the bus! Melba, in her capacity as a social worker, intervened on Mary's behalf. Getting Sunstone released and Mary probation. But the charge would make Mary's future life difficult. We returned to the condemned house for just a short time before its owner showed. Rather than being upset, she was impressed with the way the house looked. A couple of weeks later, she decided to meet the housing codes so she could legally rent it out. When we explained that we could not pay rent, she said she would like to let everybody stay, but she needed the money. Charlie gave her a new stereo to buy us some time, but as the deadline approached, we didn't know where we were going to live. Chapter 10 the hills on the edge of the valley. Cocky Sadie, gallivanting lady, see how she strut. Always on the heel and toe, and always putting on a show. The smaller the pants, the bigger the butt. Oh, Sadie, Sadie May, who did you fall in love with today? Will you tell us, or are you going away? Sitting cross-legged in your black silk scanties, evilest of all her aunties, bragging bold and bare-faced, getting your high-heeled boots laced. Her mouth is puckered, her eyes are shady. Got a booty full of acid, Sadie? Got a head full of crazy schemes. Wants to turn the world on, telling tales and making scenes. I always ignore you when you're here. Out goes the thumb, and she's gone. Got a bag full of tricks and pick up sticks. Wanna come? She's back at dawn. Purring proud and talking loud. Been to London to frighten the mouse. Well, just so happens we need a house. And Sadie rolls in like an avalanche, shouting, Hey, you guys, I found us a ranch. Lynette Fromey circa 1971. At the end of Topanga Canyon Boulevard, the Santa Susana Pass climbs the foothills between big boulders. The background scenes in old cowboy movies. A hairpin turn crosses the freight train tunnel, the tracks descending into a canyon. But the winding black top ascends to and past a big oval corral dozens of horses, and a slope off the asphalt onto the dirt street of a Wild West movie town, with hitching rails, a boardwalk, and a long row of wooden buildings with swayed back roofs. Spawn's Movie Ranch. Now, we'll go past the movie set, like we did when we first came. <laughs> 
past the owner's grungy bungalow and down a sandy road that can't be seen from the highway. It lumps along through territory thick with trees, dark, the pit of mystery at night, and in bright meadow clearings. Here's a fork, one road going down to a trickling creek, the other over a split log bridge, barely safe enough to cross. And we cross it. Now, to your right is the car and truck boneyard. Dull mechanical skeletons. And on the other side of the road near the mountains is the gypsy wagon. A colorfully painted wood shack on big wagon wheels. About a quarter mile in, you can see a house near the end of the road. It has a kitchen wired with electricity a stone fireplace in the front room, two bedrooms, and an unfinished bathroom. Opposite the house and up a hill are the skeletal frames of two outlaw shacks for movie use. Crooked, holy, and two stories high with open lofts. Beyond these, into the eucalyptus grove, the road soon ends in deep gullies giving way to 27 acres of horse hoof trails through grassland and mountain boulders. There are caves in those hills where runaway kids painted their names and left their old blue jeans. On the other side of the mountain is a half-buried ghost town called the Indian Mesa. Long hairs we're living in the house when we first came, and they told us where we might park our bus and stay a spell. And there were these wild animal boys, runaways from the suburbs, who lived in the hills half naked, and came down just to hang around the corners of the buildings and watch us and run off again. Three or four of them came around the bus one day just after Charlie had left for town. They were skittish, but as eager as young dogs. They wanted to see the inside of the bus, and they wanted to see girls. A moment later, Charlie came back to the bus for something, and when he got inside, I heard fierce growls and sounds inhuman. Then I saw the boys leaping from the bus, scattering in the hills. Charlie told me he got mad because they were sneaking behind his back. And that meant that they couldn't face him. The valley suffered a heat wave that summer, the metal bus becoming an oven at night. So we cleaned up the outlaw shacks where night breezes blew between the warped boards. And the lofts, we could drift to sleep under constellations we never thought of during the day, until a sharp splinter of sunlight forced us up, squinting and thirsty. Towel and toothbrush in hand, <clears throat> I'd head down to the creek. I'd likely meet Brenda coming up, gripping the dry grass with her arched feet, her body damp beneath loose shorts, and some relic of a soft blouse that always looked feminine on her. No matter how hot it was, Brenda looked cool. She'd start breakfast in the hippie's house. Sometimes I'd run red head on into the milkmaid snake hauling a bucket of water for cooking. She'd been up early, ambling the woods. She was cub-like, cat-cub, curious, near fearless, just a little clumsy. Walking into the shallow creek, I'd wake more, my feet rousing by spring water and cold stones. In a deeper crater, 
I'd strip and drop under, bolting from cold shock. If it happened that several of us were there together, we rippled around smiling and not saying much. Sometimes we had to hide while horseback riders passed. The owner of the ranch rented out his 60-some horses. <clears throat> well, the drought persisted. The creek went down, and the hills for miles around turned bone dry and barren. On the brittle boardwalk fronting the shacks, wheat girls sat on wooden crates, embroidering patches for Charlie's vest. We concentrated deeply to keep from thinking of the heat, swiping at flies, and brushing back the sweat that trickled into our ears and eyes. Then one day, Patty and Ella returned from a hitchhiking trip to the city and told us of a young man and a Rolls Royce who had stopped for them. He had taken them to the estate he rented near Beverly Hills, where they spent the afternoon in his treehouse, talking about coming to consciousness. Dennis was a handsome musician, the drummer for a well-known West Coast music group. He had invited the girls to bring the rest of us to see him. So one evening, a car full of us went for a drive through the valley to the coast and up Sunset Boulevard to the Pacific Palisades. Finding Dennis's iron gates wide open, we followed his driveway around woods and well-kept lawns to the carport of a wide-ranging ranch house Cabanas and pool. A smaller version of the big house, a guest house, was lit. When no one answered at the big house, we went to the guest house and found the door open. But Dennis was not in. Patty and Ella had assured us that Dennis would have us make ourselves at home. So we entered to wait resting ourselves on thick white rugs around a fireplace. We lit logs for ambience. There was no kindling but the phone book, much of it already gone to the same purpose. The master of the house soon returned and was frightened. He did a quavering dance, mocking himself, as he did not even remember Patty and Ella at first. Then he smiled widely in firelight, inviting us to follow him through the patio into the main quarters, past a massive antique dining table, and into the living room where claw-foot brocade couches faced a mantel stone fireplace in the style of 19th century hunting lodges. We talked back and forth sang a little, and after the evening's exchange, Dennis outright invited us to stay. We told him about the black bus, and the many more of us, and he said to bring them. Whoever claimed that we had moved into Dennis's house uninvited was either untruthful or uninformed.